The following is brought to you by the Starfleet Podcast Network, SPN, The Spin. That was the thing that amazed me was how you were able to actually get performances out of vo- out of the voices because the, the voices weren't just, uh, it sounds like DeForest Kelly saying these words, or it sounds like Leonard Nimoy saying these words. You could actually pick up that there was, that there was some acting behind it. This is Beyond Trek Podcast. I am Big J. I'm joined with Jonathan Lane, fan film factor, blogger, extraordinaire. Extraordinaire. So, yeah. I'm ex- I'm extraordinaire. I'll throw that in there. <laughs> so Jonathan messaged me yesterday and uh, said I would definitely want to talk with him uh, in, the, in the next day. And then I saw the reason why, because he had a fan film that he released and it was quite a piece of work. It was very interesting. So I don't want to take the thunder away from you. So Jonathan, why don't you go ahead and get us started? Tell us about this, this film you made. You want me to do my own intro? Oh, geez. You know, on fan film factor, you know, when I, when I do an interview or, you know, I, I, I introduce the fan film myself. I, I save my guests the extra hassle of having to explain it to people, but I'll do that for you. All right. Part of my service. Uh, <laughs> Thank you. Well, it's I, I, I don't want to take away from what you may be, uh, you know, talking about it. Uh, I know you did use AI uh, for the the voices. So this was uh, a film with Spock and McCoy in it, mm-hmm. uh, which was amazing how you're able to get the uh, the voices in this story to be told. And it really sounded pretty authentic, which is it, it shocked the living daylights out of me. It, it's scary uh, that we're at that level of technology now. You know, it it started about a year ago, last May. Uh, my son Jaden was in a robotics world championships in Dallas. And mm-hmm. uh, to save money, we stayed with Mr. Ray Myers, who we all know, uh, at least you do. Uh, he was uh, one of my big donors for Interlude. And <clears throat> he has since gone on to become a a very big player in fan films, works a lot with Josh uh, Irwin on, on the Avalon Universe stuff, and just an all-around awesome guy. And mm-hmm. uh, he and his family have a very large house in Plano, Texas, and he offered Jaden and me some um, some sleeping space there, and, and a lot of fun was had by all. Um, Ray is the CTO, Chief Technology Officer, of a tech company down there in Dallas. And a little before we were there last May, he was given a job by the board of directors to research AI, yes, research AI, <laughs> um, figure out what we can do with it. Right. As a company, because uh, like everybody wants to be involved in AI, but nobody really knows how yet. It's yeah. Sort of like, sort of like the internet was back in 1995. It was like, okay, well, we need a, a, a website. Is that what it's called? Uh, what, mm-hmm. what do we do? So um, Ray found a number of things, but one of the things he found was 11 labs and um, they have a website that contains an algorithm that if you type words into a text box, it will speak those words in any voice you want it to. You can have it generate its own voice. Uh, based on whatever your parameters are, old man, young woman, um, little girl, uh, you know, uh, Asian person, Latino, uh, basically anything you want, it will do for you. Or you can upload your own voice samples to it and it will recreate a synthesis of that voice, uh, depending on the quality of the samples that you give it. And we were staying with Ray and he showed us this. Uh, one of the first things he, he did was, uh, was, was he had to do a a version of Alec Peter's voice, (laughs) uh, uh, apologizing for everything that's, that's happened with Axonar. It was kind of funny. Uh, but uh, anyway, we we played with it for a bit. We 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 had a, a speech by Joe Biden that my uh, my son wrote, where where Biden oh. was basically telling America that he he got up in the middle of the night and he he wet the bed and um you know then then he had to go to the bathroom and 
Um, it, it was, it, I'm not going to go there. We're, we're really? still, still voting for Bi- for Biden, but, uh, but yeah, it was absolutely hilarious. Uh, <laughs> actually, maybe I'll send it to you and you can insert it there. <laughs> As long as that doesn't get us in trouble with the uh, the Democratic Party or any other political watchdog. You know what? I voted for Biden last time. I'm going to vote for Biden this time. If they've got a problem with me being the one supplying the um, the, the, the speech, um, you know, just deal with it. Yeah. <laughs> but anyway, here it is, folks. Hello, America. I would like to inform you that I woke up this morning and went to the bathroom, then went back to sleep because it was 1 a.m., I woke up again at two and went to pee again, then went back to sleep. I woke up again. I think it was 2.30. To, actually, I think it was two. No, it was 2.30. Anyway, I then took a shit and went back to sleep. I woke up again at three and found out that I had peed the bed. I then woke up at four and found out that I shit the bed. I think there might be something wrong with me. <laughs> okay so that was our first experience with uh 11 labs and we were just we were blown away by it yeah and at the time i i hadn't even thought about doing the fan film with it but when i got home i was like i wonder if i could do a star trek voice with it and then i remembered that i had written this it wasn't even a fan film. It wasn't even a short story, although I did run a short story contest with it. It was more of a script for a two man stage play. Uh, it was, it was McCoy and Spock. Um, Kirk had just died. I died in air quotes because it was uh, in Star Trek generations. Right. And, and uh, everybody thought he had, he had died rescuing the enterprise B. And I, I wrote this. It was just one of those things where, I, like, literally writing it out of my mind. I was just watching it happen and typing it in, you know, in, in almost a trance. It's like these were what the two men were saying to each other. Uh, McCoy was tortured by this. I mean, he always thought he he would die before Kirk. Uh, you know, he's he's gotten drunk in a bar. He's he's trying to to dull his pain. Uh, and in walks Spock. Uh, and. Spock is the last person McCoy wants to see because, you know, McCoy is sad. He is miserable. He is as emotional as you can get. And the last thing you want to see is a person who doesn't seem to be affected by the death of his best friend. Mm -hmm. Uh, But in in fact, that's exactly what McCoy needs. He needs the other point of the triangle. Uh, and he needs to see how somebody is dealing with it. And at the same point in time, Spock needs to see McCoy uh, dealing with it emotionally because Spock can't, he can't allow himself to do that. So it's 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 this very beautiful, quiet dialogue that just, it goes on for about 15 minutes. And, you know, there are some very poignant moments. Most of them are McCoy's because, you know, he's the one who's feeling um, although there's a couple of moments where, where Spock kind of lets his guard down. And I also wrote it to cover some little trekky Easter eggs that uh, I just decided would, would be kind of fun. Like, you know, for example, McCoy says at one point, Scotty doesn't believe he's really dead. And that was just my tip of the hat to the Star Trek The Next Generation episode relics where Scotty yeah. said, I knew Jim Kirk would rescue me. Uh, um, I caught that. That was a nice nod. Well, at that point, Scotty knows Jim Kirk's dead. Why would he think? And um, and then another thing that I put in there at the very end was McCoy tells Spock, "You need to loosen up. You, you need to ha- you need to have a sense of humor. You need to break some rules every so often, and you know, use a little cowboy diplomacy." And it was really for me. It was like it it almost made sense that Spock's change in unification to being a, more of a rule breaker would come from McCoy because it was either, it would either come from Kirk or it would come from McCoy. And obviously it couldn't come from Kirk anymore, but if this was the last gift that Kirk gave Spock of, of saying, you know, this is how to be human. You break some rules. Not everything is logical. So, so I have this sitting on my hard drive and I had always thought 
maybe I'll do something with this. You know, um, maybe, you know, when I, when I finally got into fan films, I wrote this back in 2010 before I even started doing the blog. That was 2015, 2016. Um, but when I finally got into fan films, I thought, you know, maybe I could do this as a fan film. Very, very simple to film. Just, you know, we can even do it as a stage play. Just have, you know, two actors on stools in a black stage and just do it that way. But I just, I sort of felt like there weren't, good enough actors out there to do it who pardon me who, who looked like mccoy or spock and um i mean like i'd love to have jens donbeck you know the german spock do it because he, he he looks like spock but right he's, he's got the the serious german accent and i wasn't sure if that would would work um and then there's a fellow named frank jenks who's a cosplayer who looks so much like mccoy but uh, i didn't know if if frank could carry the the emotion the gravitas of it so anyway it just it just kind of sat and did nothing on my hard drive for you know 23 years for well not for 23 years for for 13 years yeah and then when i came home from dallas and i was thinking what could i do with with this 11 labs thing i thought what if i try to make an audio drama of this stage play that i did and so i started using 11 labs uh at first i was using it at the base level of like five dollars a month and mm -hmm. they give you like you know five thousand characters uh to do and uh, what i quickly discovered was was that that that's way too little uh, <laughs> uh just a few sentences from either one of them is like 100 or 200 or 300 uh characters so right um so anyway I, I signed up for the 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 biggest one which was the 99 dollars a month version and I, and I started playing with it I, I sampled a bunch of different um voice snippets from from spock and from mccoy or more specifically from from deforest kelly and um and leonard nimoy because you know they, they do a lot of stuff they've they've done convention appearances and interviews and various other things as well as star trek and i wanted to get as much of them older as I could, you know, I, they, they had to be the older characters. <clears throat> so as I started playing with it, what I discovered much to my fascination and delight is that 11 labs and very unlike other voice synthesizers, 11 labs outputted speech could act it would use the words that it was talking, that it was speaking as cues of what to do with the tones and the emotion that was coming out. That's scary. And it was, it was more than just, it was more than scary. I mean, it was, it was mind blowing. Yeah. I mean, it was just, and, you know, sometimes it was wrong. You know, sometimes I, I couldn't get what I wanted from McCoy or Spock um, because the words that they were saying was, were different. Like if McCoy was being sarcastic, <clears throat> how do I get that? You know, McCoy says, I wasn't exactly looking to, you know, uh, you know, I, uh, whatever it was, he says, uh, you know, it, uh, when Spock says, you know, it was very difficult to find, you know, find you. And <laughs> I say, well, I wasn't exactly looking to uh, publicize my whereabouts. Yeah. You know, but then I discovered that you could direct the actors by adding to what they say. So at the beginning of a speech where McCoy is being sarcastic, you simply say, I'm feeling very sarcastic now. Or, boy, am I angry, exclamation point. Uh, and if you do that, you can always chop that piece off. But what happens is by giving the computer that prompt, the rest of it mostly follows whatever the beginning part of it is. Um, but the only limitation that I discovered is that you really have to do it in little tiny chunks. Because if you gave it like, you know, a paragraph or, you know, like more than five sentences of stuff to do, sometimes it would start what I call drifting, where it would start going a little bit 
off the rails and a little bit more off the rails. And then suddenly McCoy is sounding like Gollum. Uh, right. Yeah. It's got progressively worse. And, you know, if you're doing this in chunks of like a thousand or 1500 words each and you're, and it goes wrong, you're, you're using up so much of your allotment for the month and just, you know, wasted takes. So yeah. most of my takes were like, you know, maybe a hundred to 400 words at, at, at the maximum. Um, but, uh, you know, I would, I would just keep going until I got the take I wanted. Sometimes that took five or 10 tries. Uh, one time it took 112. 112 takes. Uh -huh. Wow. And this yeah. is you that counted that? a lot of my money. Yeah. <laughs> oh man. I, do you remember which line it was that, that took all that? Oh, I don't know. I don't remember which one it was. Uh, I, that would be, that would be something. Yeah. And, uh, th that was the thing that really amazed me with, with the film, which, uh, by the way, is called an absent friend, uh, for anyone who didn't, uh, much better read the title of yeah. what's that <laughs> much better than your dead Jim. Right. Uh, right. <laughs> that would have been horrible. <laughs> um, that was the thing that amazed me was how you were able to actually get performances out of, vo out of the voices because the, the voices weren't just, uh, it sounds like DeForest Kelly saying these words, or it sounds like Leonard Nimoy saying these words. You could actually pick up that there was, that there was some acting behind it. That, and that was the part that really, that really kind of threw me off was because I, I was ex going into it. I was expecting just you know, words being said in, in their voices, but there was, there was actually uh, inflection that was being done. And there was, uh, it was more of like an intelligent back and forth dialogue, which that really it kind of threw me for a loop. And it sounds like that was, it sounds like it wasn't easy to accomplish. It, it was not easy, but you know, um, I, I am an obsessive perfectionist. Um, mm -hmm. As Josh Irwin will tell you, uh, when we were editing interlude, um, I mean, it, it, I drove him crazy. <laughs> uh, and, um, you know, I'll, I'll, I'll tell you a story back in design school. I went, I, I, I graduated with a degree in psychology that I never use uh, from Cornell, but then I went on to Pratt Manhattan for a two year associate's degree in design, yeah, graphic design. And that was 1990, 91. Um, and my typography teacher, and this is going somewhere. So just get comfortable. It's a good story. Uh, my, my typography teacher, Rose Wasserman, who was, you know, remember when the, when, when, when the monks were, were hand lettering the Bible in the middle ages in the Bibles and they were, you know, were basically making like one Bible per year and everything. Like that. Yeah. Well, Rose was standing behind them saying, what's your letter spacing? Um, <laughs> he was a little old, um, <laughs> And so 1990, 1991 was just the advent of desktop publishing and computers were starting to be used to do professional graphic design layouts and, you know, page setups for printers and all sorts of stuff. But not a lot of older designers knew how to use the technology. <clears throat> and Rose was very much of the opinion that computers were evil. So she would take points away from us if we used the computer to do our typography homework. Oh. I took this as a challenge. Really anti-technology. Oh my goodness, yeah. I mean, she she was actually a big advertising executive in New York during the 1950s. Um, I mean, I know she, I said she was old, but I mean, you know, <laughs> she <laughs> she was she she made her her career in the 50s and the 60s. And um you know, back in those days, you hand lettered everything and, mm -hmm. you know, you did not use computers to do it. And, and, and the reason that she didn't like computers was because she felt like <clears throat> the, the students would do something on, you know, the Mac, the Macintosh or whatever, and they would use whatever desktop publishing or word processing program that was and figure everything was perfect. You know, everything would be Helvetica. Right. And, <laughs> You know, or times the <laughs> Roman or, or or whatever. You know, I had I, I think at the time I had like you know twenty five or like two hundred and fifty different fonts on my computer. Anything but Comic Sans, right? right. Um, you know, or Papyrus. 
Uh, <laughs> but um, anyway, what I, you know, what she wanted to teach us was, was were things like kerning, where like if you have the letter L and the letter T next to each other, you have to kind of squeeze them together because they have all of this space between them. As Rose would say, I could drive a truck through that. <laughs> um, so, you know, you, you, you needed to kern them and get them closer together to take out some of that negative space. Mm -hmm. Well, I would do that. And I would hand in homework assignments. And I would challenge Rose to tell me which ones I'd hand lettered and which ones I did with the computer. Oh, so you like poking uh, the bear. I was, I was an arrogant son of a bitch, but you know what? I was also one of Rose's best students and she knew it and I knew it. And my goal, which I ended up achieving at the end of a full semester <clears throat> of having Rose for typography or two semesters, um, was I got her to go from believing that computers were evil to believing that computers were a necessary evil. And I considered that to be a huge accomplishment uh, because I didn't just let the computer make my decisions for me. I knew what I wanted. And when the computer didn't give me exactly what I wanted, I would fix it. Here we are 35 years later and I'm getting AI sound that was close to what I wanted, but not quite there. You know, sometimes Spock's voice would have a little hiss in it, you know, or there would be a little reverb, you know, from McCoy, because everything was different. You know, the thing about AI, if you've ever used it, is like, it's always like you've never done this before. It always gives you a brand new something or other. So mm -hmm. um, the, the thing was that I could use Adobe Audition, uh, which is an, a sound editing program to you know equalize the voices and get rid of the hums and the hisses and whatever else was was wrong i could make the volume more even uh i could slow it down i could speed it up i could add pauses you know if i wanted mccoy to stop at some point and with a little cap and kirk pause or cap and kirk pause uh, i could add that or i could take it out um, I could change the volume in the middle of something when he's yelling at the bartender, you know, I just basically raised the volume of that. Yeah. Um, so, you know, I did a lot of extra work on it because, you know, I'm a freaking perfectionist. Mm -hmm. Um, but it was just so amazing what I got, even in those initial takes, um, I mean, even if it took me 30 or 40 takes to get something, sometimes I was like, I know exactly what I want. I know exactly what I want. And McCoy would give me a line reading. And when I say McCoy, I mean, McCoy, I mean, an algorithm. The computer. Would, yeah. You know, would give me a line reading and it goes, wow, that's pretty good. I hadn't even thought about doing it that way. That's, that's not bad. And I would save that file. You know, usually I would like end up with like four or five different potential ones that I would use. Sometimes I'd mix and match. I could cut this and put this with this. And sometimes I couldn't because they didn't really match. But, uh, you know, it was, it, was, it was a lot of work. I mean, it was probably about 200 hours over the course of two months to get the audio done. Yeah. And so the the animation, did you... Did you do that also? How was the how's the animation done? Who who did that part of it? Perfect next question. When I had the final audio drama, which mm -hmm. was like I said about 15 minutes long, the only problem that I had and it was a little bit frustrating was that because I had taken this in little snippets, you know, one or two or three sentences at a time, especially from McCoy who had longer uninterrupted, you know, bits of dialogue, um things wouldn't match like the first three sentences would sound like this and then the next three sentences would still sound like mccoy but just maybe a little lower mm -hmm. or a little fuller or a little raspier or whatever i mean we, just, we wouldn't be a complete and total i mean i tried to get it to match as much as possible i tried to get mccoy to sound like mccoy because sometimes you know it, it wouldn't sound like mccoy sometimes it would sound british uh <laughs> it sounded like a female i mean it was like a, whatever the ai thought it was doing i don't know what it was but you know sometimes mccoy was completely out of left field it's like that's not even close to mccoy it's not even right close to... um but even just you know the ones that did sound like DeForest kelly 
didn't quite match. And what I thought to myself is if I could turn this into a visual, I can change the image when that tonal quality or that cadence changes. So if McCoy is talking, if we go from this shot of McCoy to this shot of McCoy to this close up of McCoy or whatever, every time it changes, maybe the ear will be more forgiving if the eye sees something different. And I thought, okay, well, then let's do that. I had no idea how. And um, first I thought, you know, maybe I'll just use some stills from Star Trek, do a little Photoshopping. Obviously, you've got McCoy in the bar in Star Trek Three. Right. Um, you don't really have Spock in the bar, but maybe I could just, you know, take some shots of Spock and, you know, get other background of bars or whatever and just, you know, a lot of Photoshopping. But um, that was it, it was it was a lot of work. And I just I sort of felt like I didn't really have and, and McCoy looks too young uh, in Star Trek three when he's in his civilian clothes, yep. even in Star Trek four. I needed him looking like he looked in Star Trek six. But in Star Trek six, he spends the entire time in his, you know monster maroon uniform so right um, so strike one and then i thought well i'm using ai to do the voices why don't i use ai to just generate dr mccoy in a bar you know let's see that and, um ai is not smart enough to do that yet if you say dr mccoy from star trek even if you say from star trek the movies or star trek, in, in a monster maroon uniform or in a starfleet uniform from 22 <laughs> 93 or you know or or in civilian clothes or whatever it gives you dr mccoy from tos okay so it's it's gonna do tos no matter how you try to word it and, and get it exactly with a six-fingered hand by the way it hasn't quite figured out yet. <laughs> uh, but um and and it's, it's like the uniform is always like weird also it's like doesn't quite match because it's ai or whatever and the bar is always different so you know you might you might have different angles or whatever but for the most part the angle is almost always forward or three quarter the bar is always different and it just strike two it just it mm -hmm. didn't work out. and so interestingly enough i guess it was last september or so when the very short treks that um cbs produced uh, which were animated style uh but modern Star Trek shorts of about three or four minutes each uh, were released on YouTube. And they, they brought back the old filmation quality animation. And I saw this and I was like, that's it. That's what I'm going to do. I'm going to make TAS, the animated series. I'm going to make TAS in the movie era. Nice. And then I was like, but how? Because I can't draw. I went to design school. I didn't go to illustration school. I'm not an illustrator. I'm a designer. Uh -huh. I deal with concepts, not details. <laughs> uh, but um, I often like to say the difference between an illustrator and a designer is like the difference between a fireman and a police officer. They both drive around in, in vehicles with sirens on them and they help people and they wear uniforms and they use tools, but they do completely different things. Right. And I, I can't draw to save my life. <laughs> and me neither. I am a horrible drawer. So, which is not to say I can't fix a drawing. You know, if somebody does it first, I can make little changes to it, but I can't do it from scratch. And about the same time, <laughs> pardon me, Vance Major came out with a Constar comic book. And it was just like a few pages or whatever, but, um, I thought, you know, this is pretty cool. I'd, I'd like to interview as his artist, you know, let's say I've interviewed Vance about a million times. So let's interview the artist, find out, you know, what he's all about. Yeah. <clears throat> and I contacted him. His name is Matt Slade. He lives in Louisiana. And um, as I was chatting with him, I thought to myself, maybe he might be interested in helping me to animate, draw this fan film told him about the project. I shared the audio file with him. I said, you know, would you be able to draw in, you know, TAS style? 
And he said, well, I mean, because keep in mind, the guidelines say you can't pay anybody. So, you know, he's trying to say yes without, you know, committing to too much work. Right. And he said, you know, if I could have something to trace over, I could do this. Um, obviously, he'd have to, you know, make a civilian clothes for McCoy and he, you know, change Spock into a uniform or whatever. He'd add wrinkles to the face, but at least he'd be basing it on stuff that had already been done. So... Thus began another month of work for me <laughs> as I went through, if you go to trekcore.com, T-R-E-K-C-O-R-E, you will discover screen caps, literally like tens of thousands of them yeah. from all of the various Star Trek television series, you know, from TOS to T, you know, TNG, DS9, Voyager, and of course the animated series. And so what I did was I went through every one of the 22 episodes of the animated series. I basically screen capped or copied their screen caps of anything with Spock or McCoy in it. And I put them into layered Photoshop documents, some of them with like a hundred different layers. And then I went through and chose what I consider to be good shots of McCoy and good shots of Spock. You know, some of them, you know, three quarters, some of them close up, um, you know, some of them sideways um, and just concatenating them together. I put together a storyboard mm -hmm. and the storyboard looks really, really weird. <clears throat> it's um, it's up on my uh, my my Google Drive for anybody who wants to see it. But it is um, it's just really, really weird because you just see the static T. T-A-S, you know, Spock, you know, Spock in his old blue tunic, McCoy in his old blue tunic, and they're not moving, they're not animated or anything, but this was just, I laid it out in storyboard format with the audio running underneath it for the whole thing. And I had like maybe 10 or 12 different shots for each character. So maybe 24, 25 in total. So that's not too much for the illustrator to do with the understanding that, you know, he would do different lip positions for each one as well which is, by the way, still a heck of a lot of work. Uh, <laughs> Doing, d moving lips? Well, you know. I would we, imagine. Well, we ultimately discovered, um, thanks to a YouTube video, because everything is on YouTube, that in order to make realistic lip movements, you only need nine cells. Nine? That's nine. it? Mm -hmm. Closed. You need an O. Uh -huh. You need a W, R, or U. So O, U, close. O is bigger. U is that. S and SK and SH and CH and Z all do the same thing. Uh -huh. A and E, same thing. E, N. So E, E, N, basically like the A and the E, but a little bit more closed. And L, have the tongue coming out. So T, H, L, F, L. Right. You put all this together and you basically can put everything, every consonant and every vowel sound that you need into nine different lip movements. Wow. Amazing. Now, see, it would have been cool if you went the Thunderbirds route. Uh, was it Thunderbirds? The, the the mouth was like a real person's mouth talking, but the it was dolls or the uh, animation. Uh, what what was that? I, I don't think that was Thunderbirds. No. But, you know, but but they did do that, you know, like in the. Um, uh, you know what I'm talking about, though, right? Yeah. The, well, like the, the bass animations, you know, when they when they used to do, uh, you know, the, the the Santa Claus stuff, you know, the Christmas stuff, they, they they would have the marionettes. And then what they would do is they would just draw over the cells, the movements of the mouth. Uh, so, you know, you could do that as well. Yeah. But, you know, with TAS, it's what they did. Um, and the, the, the thing about TAS, thank God they did this, is... The faces were all symmetrical. 
so like Spock's hair is obviously easy, but so was McCoy's. You know, I have my part on this side here, this side. Right. Um, you know, for McCoy, his part was sort of the same on both sides. It just came down in the middle. Uh, so I could easily flip McCoy and flip Spock because um, I wanted McCoy to always be, you know, pointed in this direction. Yeah. And I wanted Spock to always be pointed in this direction. So if I had like the perfect pose for one of them and they were pointing in the wrong direction, just, just flip it. Uh, so Matt began to make the drawings and then I did the animation because the animation was so meticulous. So based on every lip movement, I would go through the, the, the timeline and I would just bring out each lip movement that I needed when that syllable, that consonant, that phoneme, whatever it was. I mean, like the word Spock, which is one syllable, starts out with s, right? Mm -hmm. And then it has a p. So it goes from the s to the p to the a ah, to the k, which is the same as the s. So Spock has four different cells in it. Okay. Okay. You know, enterprise. Eh, ter, t, the T, so that's two. R is the R O W little thing. So enter, prize, p, r. So r is once again that little o u. I is I and a ah, and i. So I. And then s. So enterprise is seven different cells. Uh, I don't ever get, you don't even get me started on the word appropriate. Oh my Whoa. God. Yeah. Um, but anyway, that's, that's how I did it for months and months and months at a time. And, you know, he would, he, he would keep feeding me like new cells or whatever. And I would like take a weekend and put those in, show them how it look. And, um, but it was fun because, you know, I'd be doing this. I'd be like, you know, for like five or 10 minutes, I would be just like staring and like moving this and moving that and whatever. And, you know, I would get like a sentence or two done and I was like, I need to take a brain break. And so I would go and I would just like, okay, let's see what this looks like. And I would play it out and I would see McCoy's lips moving, you know, to the words like, holy crap, that does look like he's saying those words. It was magical. It's like, wow, wow, all that work I've just been doing for the last 10 minutes, it really works. Yeah. <laughs> and when it doesn't work, you know it, you know, like the, 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 the eye and the brain are very forgiving if it doesn't look perfect. Right. You know, as far as the libus moving or whatever, but if something's off, if something's like, if the T comes in a little early or, you know, you're still seeing the E when the E should have faded into a closed mouth position or whatever, you do notice that. And so there's a lot of little, you know, moving it like by literally like one frame, and moving that from one frame. And it was just. That sounds tedious, which I, and I, I know that there's certainly a lot of work that I do in, in video editing and uh, audio. And you're right. You can kind of get to where you're, you're knuckle dragging because you're, you're just adjusting that one little thing. You spend more time on it than you should, or that you needed to, but it's like, okay, I, I, I want this to be perfect. I don't know why, but I'm going to sit here until, until that's done. And it's the kind of thing that nobody's going to notice you know, you're, you're going to know it because you did it, but you know, it's just, it's, it's one of those things. It's kind of like, okay, well, it's for my peace of mind. I made it exactly the way I wanted it to be, whether anyone notices that or not. Well, I'll tell you my perfectionism um, probably drove Matt a little crazy um, because like, for example, Spock's uniform, I wanted him in the bomber jacket. That's my favorite Star Trek uniform of all time. Mm -hmm. um, but like, you know, for example, you know, the, the, the arm braid, you know, where, you know, he's got all the little, you know, pips and squeaks yeah. or whatever on it. Um, I had to draw all those on. I mean, he, you know, he, he would, he would start it up and like put little things on there and I would like, you know, I'd go in and I would like meticulously adjust them pixel by pixel to make sure, you know, the long ones were there and then the short pips were there. And, um, 
you know, the number of times they made him redo the captain's rank pin. Uh, I don't even want to count. But there were a lot of times where I just said, you know, look, Matt, you're you're working so hard. Let let me fix this. Right. Uh, you know, and and some artists are like, no, 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 I'll fix it. You know, don't touch it or whatever. Like, you know, Matt was fine. He was like, you sure you want to do some of the work? I'm happy to happy to have that. So um so we really did work collaboratively on on a lot of stuff. And you know, like if if um you know, Sulu wasn't looking just right or Chekhov wasn't looking just right in one of those little flashback things, you know, he would say like, I, I, I can't seem to get it. And I would go in and I would just, you know, I would redo some of the wrinkles or, you know, move a nose or a nostril or whatever that I can do. Um, and then he would just draw over what I would, I would give him back. Um, and that's and one of the things that, that we did, by the way, um, and, you know, we discussed this together uh, and and he was very nice to to do this and add this to all the other drawings that he was doing is there were a number of places where I added little flourishes to break up the monotony because otherwise it's just Spock talking, McCoy talking, Spock talking, McCoy talking back and forth. It could get very boring visually. Right. So what I would do is I would add in little I could call them flourishes, flashbacks or whatever. So, you know, if they're talking about Scotty and, and Chekhov, um, we show a shot from Star Trek Generations where the two of them are, you know, standing there in engineering, looking out the hole, uh, in the hole. And, um, you know, we're talking about Sulu. We see, we see Sulu. We see Demora when Spock says, you know, I, you know, Demora is the, an engine, the chief helm officer of the Enterprise. So, you know, he also did some really, really nice recreations of some TOS episodes, including uh, the Tholian Web, Kirk in a spacesuit, and um, two shots from Shore Leave, and um, a shot, a great shot of Chekhov getting shot from um, uh, Spectre of the Gun, and and Nomad uh, from um, from the Changeling. And if you if you go and look at the picture of Nomad, he did a great Nomad. Um, mm -hmm. But those little radiator grill holes on Nomad, he didn't bother doing because that was just like, you know, who who the hell cares about that? You know, right. <laughs> I, I I am working for peanuts, literally. So yeah. <laughs> let's let let's um I wasn't even getting peanuts. But uh, anyway, uh, so I went in and I created those little grill holes for uh for him, uh, for no man. So it was, it was very collaborative and, yeah. you know, he was, he was great to work with. He was a, a, one of the best experiences I've ever had with an illustrator in my entire life. That was one of the things that I also really, really appreciated, uh, because this is something that I did. I've been making a lot of these behind the scenes videos for Alec Peters and for Axanar. Uh, and I've, uh, you know, in, in the, in the different, video editing that I've done. And this was something that I even, uh, carried over from, I was a sports producer for a news station in Columbus at one point when I was in college. And what I would do is, uh, uh edit the sports highlights. So for example, if you watch the news and they get to the sports part of it, whenever you see the clip from the game, like that was what I would do was, is edit that. And, um, Whenever, whenever we would have something that would be an interview, uh, you know, showing an, an interview that an athlete did, uh, what I was taught was if, if the person is talking about this or this thing or this play, do whatever you can to show what they're talking about. So when you, when you do these things, like for example, when I'm, when I was doing the behind the scenes video, uh, if whoever was was talking during the during the interview when I was playing the uh, you know them speaking, uh, if they start talking about like the instrument panels or the view screen or the or the whatever, you show what they're talking about In instead of sitting there looking at them speaking for five minutes straight, you you cut that in with pictures or videos of what they're talking about. Um, and when you and when you did that, that was a a very very welcome addition because Spock or McCoy they're talking about a thing, and you actually show what it is they're talking about, and that that really helps with with the immersion of it. And you're right; if anything, 
that helps to break up the Spock McCoy, Spock McCoy, Spock McCoy, the, the, the back and forth. You can, you get to where you can see something different and storytelling wise, that was a great way to tell a story was to add that visual to show the animation of this is what they're talking about. So I, I definitely give you big thumbs up for that. Uh, so this, this is a, another topic that I wanted to talk about because the, the fan film guideline watchdogs are losing their shit uh, over over the entire thing. I mean, they, they, they are, they their heads are, want me to get sued. Their heads are spinning in circles. Like I mean, there's Nadav, Nadav, uh, whatever his last name is. Uh, I mean, basically just tried to, you know, lay out Paramount's legal argument. You know, if you want to sue Jonathan, this is how you do it. But he says, you know, not trying to be a, you know, a doomsayer or anything. And then he proceeds to lay out the case. Yeah. I read that like, yeah, not, 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 not to be an ass, but I'm about to be an ass. Exactly. And I was like, you know what? It, here's the thing. Um, you know, one of my very, very good friends, one of my oldest friends, we, we've known each other since high school, uh, is a lawyer out here in Los Angeles. Uh, and he's 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 worked in the entertainment industry for, I think, 30 years. Um, the first thing he told me was, you know, first of all, Jonathan, it's just a fan film, for God's sakes. Uh, and he said, the other thing is <laughs> you should have said, him, OK, hold my beer. Let me explain this to you. <laughs> well, you know, I mean, the, 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 the thing is, is that it is just a fan film. Right. Uh, but the other thing is that um, it's he uh, what was it? the first thing he said to me. He said, look, if you were to get somebody to imitate Spock. Or imitate McCoy, I mean, you know, like, like the hire an actor to do an imitation, would that be illegal? No. Hmm. OK, well, what you're doing is you're getting a computer to imitate Spock and McCoy. It's not it's not an exact. Right. Imitation. I mean, you, you, it, it, you, you can tell it's not McCoy and you can tell it's not Spock. I mean, it's close. It's great. But there's some times where, you know, they're definitely not there. Right. Um, we know it's an imitation. You know, it's 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 definitely an imitation. You're not sourcing anything directly. And what he told me is, is that it's not what you put into it, but what you get out of it is it transforms formative. And so it doesn't matter what you're sourcing. If you're sourcing Star Trek episodes or movies, or if you're sourcing interviews, or you're sourcing convention appearances or whatever, the thing is, is the algorithm is putting that together in an amalgamation. And one of the things I told him Dov was, uh, you know, the, there's a, there's a song called, um, uh, uh, I, I know what you, uh, uh, what you're thinking uh, is, is there something that's on your mind? But anyway, Spock's is pure energy. Yeah, uh, it's from the '80s, and the pure energy is a sample of a Star Trek episode it's from Aaron of Mercy, and it's definitely Spock taken directly from that episode. So their output, even though they're putting music underneath it, is a copy. What I'm doing is not a copy. I, you know, if, if McCoy says that green blooded son of a bitch, it's his revenge for all those arguments. Still lost. Um, McCoy's not saying that. And if McCoy is saying the word the, or if he's saying, you know, green blooded, which, you know, he does say green blooded, you know, if you, if you, if you go to my thing, at one point you see he calls Spock a green blooded hobgoblin. Yeah. But if you listen to that green blooded, it's not the same green blooded as was in Star Trek three. I don't even know if I sourced Star Trek three. I'm not even sure that might be too young for McCoy, but anyway, right. even, even, even if it were, it's not the same. It's transformed. It's not that exact sound sim. But, you know, the, the main thing is that even for a copyright infringement claim, mm -hmm. it's non-willful infringement only because the laws are so vague on all of this. Um, and the, the fine for a non-willful infringement is $750. So, you know, I, I can afford that. Um, and the, the, the other thing is that you have to go through tens of thousands of dollars in, in suing somebody yes. in order to get that $750. 
you know, even if they get $10,000 or $11,000 or whatever, they're spending three or four or five times that. So no, they, they don't want to go after a small fish like me. And of course, you know, going after a fan for making a fan film is bad PR, especially when you're trying to sell your company to Skydance. Um, and Skydance right. has come in. And I don't think the, I don't think the first thing Skydance wants to do is start alienating the Star Trek fans. So, um, this is, you know, this is out there. Um, you know, as for permission from the actors, I mean, that was, you know, you know somebody, somebody said, you know, you're away, uh, work from, from hardworking actors. Um, it's like, well, I'm taking away free work from hardworking actors because I can't pay anybody. Um, but I'm certainly not taking away work from Leonard Nimoy or DeForest Kelly. They're, they're dead. They can't do the work. I'm sorry. Um, and you know, I, I did actually ask Adam Nimoy, uh, for permission on this. Um, Adam wasn't able to do that because it's something that the estate would give. Um, but he did wish me luck with, uh, with, with the, the, the voiceover with the, with the project. Now, did Adam get you in touch yep. with, with the estate? Yeah, well, I, I got in touch with the law firm that handles the estate. Oh, okay. All right. I talked to the legal assistant of the lawyer specifically that does that. And he was very, very nice. He, he you know, he, he was excited by the project. He says, it sounds great. Um, and, you know, a week later, he said, you know, unfortunately, we can't give you permission. But at the same point in time, we're not telling you you can't do it. The issue is that in order to give me permission, they have to research the law on it. They have to write up some kind of contract or whatever. I mean, if they're licensing it, whether they're just giving me permission or whatever, any minute that they spend on this is billable. And the estate has to pay for that. And, you know, lawyers charge $500 to $1,000 an hour. So it oh, yeah, they're crooks. My wife's a lawyer. Oh, sorry. Except for your wife. <laughs> and by the way, she does not make the thousand dollars an hour or whatever she bills at. You know, she gets a mere pittance of that. Yeah. Um, but they have a very nice office there. Um, oh, well, their offices are gorgeous. Oh, my God. Um, but they're lawyers in Los Angeles and they're entertainment lawyers. So it's even better because you have to really look good. Yeah. Uh, but anyway, uh, but the fact is that. Uh, you know, the, the, the estate, they don't have that kind of money and they don't have that kind of time to spend. So, you know, very much like, like CBS and Paramount have a don't ask, don't tell relationship with fan films. You know, they don't give us permission. None of us get official permission to do this. The guidelines are not permission. The guard guidelines are just, if you do these things, we're not going to sue you. It's different than giving you permission. Right. But in the same way, you know, the Nimoy estate doesn't want to have to spend all this money trying to figure out how to give some random Trekkie in Los Angeles, you know, permission to do something he's probably going to do anyway. Um, and even if they did want to sue me for this eventually down the line, once again, $750, I looked it up. I'm willing to license it for $750. So, you know, whatever. Um, but, um, you know, that that's it. And and honestly, even then, you know, they would have to, they would have to, uh, you know, well, it's not even they, they, they had to prove anything. The law in California, and California is definitely the prevailing law on this because Leonard Nimoy and DeForest Kelly both lived and died in California. And I live in California. Mm -hmm. uh, and California law has an exemption specifically for using the likeness of voice or appearance or whatever of a dead person. Um, there's an exemption for a play, for a book, for a photograph, for a film, um, you know, and a number of other things. And basically the only thing you can't do is put them into a, a commercial, but everything else you're good for. So even that $750, if they wanted to go and spend tens of thousands of dollars suing me, is not something they're going to be able to get because the law, at least at this moment, uh, exempts me, which is great, which is why I released now. Um, there are pieces of legislation working their way through the California State Assembly, through the U.S. Congress, and another one working through the U.S. Senate to deal with AI, but they have not dealt with it yet. So they're still trying to figure this out. And even once they pass the, le the legislation, some of the legislation may step on fair use rules 
right and and first amendment um uh rights and such so you know they could get challenged in court so and that's more money and more time well it's more money and more time for somebody else at that point because yeah. if you want to you know if you want to challenge it in court and saying this law is you know unconstitutional or whatever because it violates first amendment rights you know that would be something for somebody who got sued after the law passed to 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 do um but the thing is is that ai legislation while it's coming is not coming particularly soon you know congress can't agree on anything right now so i don't expect anything to be coming out of the house except Senate. for banning tiktok except for banning tiktok there you go uh and naming post post offices they do they do that rather right oh now. yeah um but um yeah so you know we're still a few years away from really early ai legislation being established and even that i think is you know not going to be the final format of whatever the legislation is but you know at this point here i am releasing a fan film saying this is an example of what you can do when you know it's not revenge porn or you're not trying to you know fake a political ad or a robo call or something from a candidate or whatever you're not trying to do harm you're just trying to honor somebody in a creative way and who knows maybe the assembly or the legislature or the congress or whatever might even use this as uh, this this fan film as a way to say okay you know the law should be written in this kind of a way um or maybe they won't know about it at all i have no idea it's only had 400 or 500 views in the first day and a half so but wouldn't that be something if you were part of the the legislation the uh, you know the the creation of this uh we would either uh you know look at that as a, a good thing or a bad thing of course but i would imagine that would be a, a pretty interesting position to be in would be to have that to have this film an absent friend be an example of this is where the technology is this is what it's capable of uh and this is how it's going to be used so if we're going we're going to keep expanding technologically with with ai and uh, all of these other things we need to prepare for that what are we going to do when someone creates that that artificial intelligence that that person uh do we need to rewatch measure of a man now to be ready for that because it's it's going to happen Some, something is we're going to get to that point and uh, of course right now we're very reactionary we're not proactive about anything. We're, we're going to react to when somebody comes up with, uh, uh, with a thing and then see, okay, well, here's this thing. Now, how do we legislate it? I don't know. I, you know, it, it would be but always, be, but that's always been an issue in this country. You know, I yeah. mean, it, it, from, from anti-slavery laws and, 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 you know, the, the laws after, um, the civil war and, and, and civil rights legislation and, and the new deal policies under FDR. I mean, we, we were reacting to issues that presented themselves, you know, as we grew as a country, you know, before there was television, we didn't have any need for, you know, broadcast standards, you know, right. and now, you know, and then the whole net neutrality, you know, who, who knew the net neutrality was going to be a thing back in 1980. Uh, but, you know, now we have the internet and it needs to be established that, you know, people should all be able to get the same bandwidth, regardless of whether they're dealing, you know, with a provider that's paying more for a sweetheart deal or not. Um, you know, so, you know, I, I think there's a I think it's a good thing that AI is making us take a harder look at what's going on. Um, it's one of the reasons that I made this fan film. I, you know, I mean, part of it was, yeah, I wanted to turn my script into a fan film. But honestly, I could have turned my script into a fan film at any point during the last you know dozen years. I never did. But now that AI is becoming such a part of our lives, um, and, you know, just seeing what this 11 labs thing could do, this gave me a perfect opportunity to explore this and not only to explore it, but, but to blog about it. And so, you know, with all of this said, it's just, it's fascinating. 
It's terrifying in some cases. Um, it's exciting. It's exhilarating. Um, there's so many emotions. I mean, we, we live in interesting times. <laughs> yeah, we do. <laughs> you know, so, you know, yeah. So now I've, I've got my AI fan film out there. I, I got it out of my system. I'm not going to do another one of these folks. You know, I've, I've gotten all these comments on YouTube. People love it. They want to see more and more and more. It's like, eh, I'm sorry, but this was a year of my life. <laughs> 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 that's a year of my life i'm not going to get back but uh that's and it was a fun year of my life I, yeah. I enjoyed doing it it was it was great on a it was great to get new animation cells and be able to like a focus you know this wasn't done from beginning to end you know this 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 was done in pieces yeah. so like if i got like a new spock or whatever you know that spock appeared you know at the 12 minute mark and at the four minute mark and at the you know nine minute and 50 second mark or whatever and so i would just like suddenly like i was so excited let's just get some spock in there you just you're watching the whole thing it's like you know the still image the still image oh here's the the moving mouth and the still image still oh here's the moving mouth and you know here here's the shot of the enterprise in the middle of the nexus and um, yeah. yeah it was it was exciting to to see it all take take shape well, I think you did a very good job on it. And I know I, for one, appreciate all the work that you put into doing this film and being a part of the community that likes to create and put out content and to have uh, something positive to say about that content. Uh, hopefully at some point down the line, you'll wake up and say, you know what? I am going to do another thing, whether it's live action or uh, animation or whatnot. I think that'd be great if yeah, you, you did have that. Another fan film written. We'll we'll see what happens. With yeah, it. it's a musical. Oh, um, okay. And by the way, I had this musical before before Strange New Worlds ever did a musical. And in my <laughs> musical, they don't ask why they're singing. It's just you know, it just happens to be a musical. Um, but uh, it, it it'll be fun. And and the, and the fun part about the musical is all the songs that are in it. And they're all parody songs, of course. Mm -hmm. uh, but all the songs that are in it are songs that would have been playing on the radio while William Shatner and Leonard Nimoy and the Forest Kelly were driving to Paramount in the 1960s to film Star Trek. Oh, they're all like 50s and 60s songs. There's one song from like 1971 that I had to have in there. Like I know Star Trek wasn't on in 71. They weren't driving there, but it's, it's there anyway. But all the rest of them are uh, are, are those those classic tunes that um, people of my generation know and younger kids these days have no appreciation for right <laughs> uh jonathan where can our audience find you online social media sites blogs tell our fans where can we find more jonathan lane fanfilmfactor.com fanfilmfactor.com uh, fanfilmfactor.com that is a i think i even got the com. yeah there it is it's on. There, there we go dot com is not up there but anyway yeah fan film factor is the best place to uh to find me uh also fan film forum because everything has to have three f's with me um uh, but fan film forum on facebook um there is a patreon that i have but uh and you can find it if you go to fan film factor if you want to give me some money uh, on a monthly basis because i have costs uh just to do the the website and keep security and everything uh, firewalls and such and coasting. Um, let's see. Am I on X Twitter? Probably still somewhere. I don't know. I think stuff automatically gets posted there, but I hardly ever check that. Um, but really, you know, fan film forum on, on Facebook is, is a good place to, uh, to get in touch with me. And of course, Jonathan at fanfilmfactor.com. If you wanted to email me and say something nice and you can leave a comment on the video, um, an absent friend. If you look on uh, YouTube, you'll find it. Uh, so I think that pretty much covers it. Jonathan, thank you so much for speaking with me this evening. Really like the film. Appreciate it. Thank you for all of your work and for our audience that is listening and or watching. Live long and prosper. And by the way, thank you for interviewing me because it saves me from having to interview myself. <laughs> That would be a good project. Have you side by side interviewing yourself, just changing face this way, then face that way. Yeah. <laughs> if you enjoyed this podcast, you can support us at patreon.com slash beyond Trek. We
We are Beyond Chart Podcast. Lower your inhibitions and surrender your years. We will add inspirational and hilarious trip content to your day. Your attention will adapt to subscribe to us. Resistance is futile. <laughs>